The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Once upon a time, a mighty kingdom of the European world, now a memory of an age long forgotten by far too many. What happened to it? And why did it collapse? After the untimely death of Louis of Anjou, King of Hungary and Poland in 1382, his crown was left to be seized by one of his only two children, two daughters by the names of Mary and Jadwiga. The Polish nobility opted to place the younger of the girls, Jadwiga, on the throne, despite their disapproval of her betrothal to the young Duke of Austria, William Habsburg. This, they felt, was an easy fix, and thus they simply negotiated their way into replacing the Austrian with Jogaila, the contemporary Grand Duke of Lithuania. This video is brought to you by My Heritage. Learning general history is very important, but also is learning about our own history, which is why I chose My Heritage to find out more about it. Imagine gathering just a little information about your family tree and immediately finding out way more. This is possible because My Heritage is the best service that helps you to uncover your family history. With more than 19 billion records in its database, it's simple to find things about your own past. Like I learned that many of my partner's ancestors were Scottish and part of the Gordon clan in the 17th century. Or about my grandpa who I have no memory with that he was born in Greece. I could also easily create my family tree, which I can personalize as much as I want by adding details and pictures. And I could even bring old photos of relatives back to life by repairing, coloring, and even animating them. I chose MyHeritage because it is trusted by more than 19 million users, and it helps users with research and discovery by giving access to billions of historical data, family tree profiles, and advanced matching algorithms that function across all of its resources. By using instant discoveries with just a click of a button, you can uncover entire branches you never knew existed. My Heritage provides a portal to our past and to our roots that can help us understand who we really are. Start building your family tree. Research and find more about your own family history. Sign up for a 14-day trial and enjoy all the amazing features My Heritage has to offer by clicking the link in the description. The union of Kruo in the late summer of 1385 solidified the marriage of Yogaila to Jadwiga, his conversion from paganism to Christianity, and the subsequent imposition of his new religion onto the Lithuanian state. This shift also included the change of Poland from a monarchy to one ruled by two, with Yogaila being officially made king as Vladislav II Jagiełło on March 4, 1386, alongside his sovereign wife. With the crowns already united, it comes as no surprise that the idea of forming a union between Poland and Lithuania was becoming increasingly popular amongst the nobility, especially of the latter. Some, such as within the Lithuanian military, opposed the radical concept, but it appears that the more powerful of society's men supported it such as King and Grand Duke Sigmund II Augustus himself. A joint parliament between representatives of Poland and Lithuania thus confirmed the new union on January 10, 1569 in Lublin, Poland, leading to the signing of the Union of Lublin on July 1st of the same year. This definitively created the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. One parliament two militaries, and a vastly outnumbered and outmassed Lithuania was the end product. While many today remember the Union as being more or less Poland & Co., the Commonwealth was actually a remarkably large and mighty state at its peak. It encompassed, of course, Polish and Lithuanian lands, but additionally pieces of Estonia, Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, and Western Russia. Still, although on paper both halves of the Union were equals, the clear superior in terms of sheer size and population was Poland. 
And with all this land came, maybe in the end one too many, religions and ethnic groups. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Protestants, Muslims, and Jews, amongst Armenians, Russians, Germans, and others. Nevertheless, the Commonwealth shared one parliament and the power of the king. Not a singular monarch was constantly kept in check by that parliament and the legal structure of a semi-democratic constitutional elected monarchy. This system worked for some time, with the apex of the Commonwealth's existence coming a century after its formation. But as was the case with all good things, Polish-Lithuania was bound to come to an end. Foreign conflict and internal weakness and division can be blamed for the collapse of the short-lived Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and those came in a variety of forms. Disputes with the Ottoman Empire and Russia dominate the list of foreign rivalries, and from within, many points to the Ukrainian Cossacks as being the dynamite to break the foundation. Centered around what we know today as Zaporizhia, the Cossacks were military marvels who felt that they deserved a higher footing within the Commonwealth. Such demands were difficult for the nobility-led parliament to address, as on the one hand, the Cossacks were crucial participants in the wars with neighboring states, yet on the other, the risk of such powerful fighters becoming too powerful would threaten the nobility themselves. This ultimately pushed the Cossacks into full revolt. In 1648, the Cossacks and their Tartar allies followed the lead of Bodan Kamilnetsky into an explosive uprising across Ukrainian lands. The Commonwealth troops, who aimed to suppress the rebellion, took a brutal beating as Kamilnetsky toyed with the idea of creating an independent Ukrainian state. King Vladislav IV, in the depths of the uprising, plunged Poland-Lithuania into deeper chaos as the army continued its struggle against the Cossack rebels, dragging on into the 1650s. As the clashes raged on, the Ukrainian Cossacks soon turned to a neighbor for an unusual favor. Komolensky wanted to submit to the Tsar. The truth of what and why this occurred is hotly debated by supporters of either side, but in its simplest form, the Cossacks were simply looking to form an alliance that would see their commonwealth dismantled. Thus, the Treaty of Pereyaslav put the Cossacks under Russian protection via Tsar Alexis at the opening of 1654. This was followed by an invasion and violence from both Russia and Sweden against the wobbly Poland-Lithuania. The deluge by the latter led to a temporary occupation of the Commonwealth that ended only with the Treaty of Oliva in 1660, bringing a short respite, though solemnly foreshadowing the ends to come. Violence was far from over, but the peak of the Commonwealth had surely reached its close. The population was rapidly declining, which in turn damaged much-needed agricultural production. International relationships and infighting further pushed Poland-Lithuania toward collapse as the Commonwealth's finances dwindled. The monarchy and Parliament's power were not as strong as one would hope for a nation once viewed as a mighty European player. The nobility at the helm of the government could be easily influenced, and the existence of Parliament's Liberum Veto would allow any one puppet of the king or otherwise to veto any laws attempting to be passed. Even attempts made by the king himself during the reign of John Casimir to reform the Commonwealth's central structure were shot down, and positive change was warded off. Negative changes, however, seemed welcomed. As was the fate of most nations who'd attempted to house various ethnic and religious communities peacefully within a single border, the level of ethnic and religious tolerance in Polish-Lithuania was beginning to wane, particularly as Roman Catholicism took hold in Poland. Renewed hostilities with the nearby Turks further broke up the kingdom, this time in the form of its land all at a time when the kings themselves seemed to be becoming weaker and weaker. 
John III Sobeski may have been an exception to this rule, choosing in his lifetime to align with Austria for the purpose of rejoining the European fight against the Ottoman Empire. The warfare ended positively for the Europeans, but scarcely did anything to aid the Commonwealth's ailing bones, and by the signing of peace, King John III was already dead, as was the spirit of friendship. By the end of the 17th century, Poland-Lithuania's neighbors had already come to the conclusion that the Commonwealth was a lost cause. Instead of coming to the aid of their anti-Ottoman ally, nations such as Austria, Sweden, and Russia opted to begin preparation for the partition and collapse of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This was made easier to do in part due to the characteristics of the crumbling state, such as the Liberum Veto, which only required foreign agents to puppeteer a single member of parliament in order to exacerbate instability. The controversial election of Frederick Augustus of Saxony further heightened tensions within the Commonwealth, as many saw his crowning as illegitimate, while others took larger issue with the personal union his election created between the Commonwealth and Saxony. Such ties meant Saxony's enemies became Poland-Lithuania's enemies, and its war became their wars. This led to the invasion by Charles XII of Sweden and the forced removal of Frederick Augustus from the throne in favor of the Swedish-backed Stanisław I Leszczynski. It would take the aid and subsequent superiority of the Russian Empire to restore Augustus to the throne, by now solidifying the Commonwealth's role as a pawn of those stronger nations surrounding it. His death in 1733 only shifted the monarchy into the hands of Stanislav once more, who was now also favored by the French thanks to the marriage of his daughter to Louis XV. This led the Russians back into Poland's Lithuania to replace Stanislav once again, this time with Augustus III, son of the second. The Commonwealth was becoming a playground for stronger powers like Russia, Sweden, and even Prussia. What was left was too far gone to be salvaged. Russia hoped to keep the ruined kingdom under its own wing with the election of Stanislav II Augustus Poniatowski, but his placement on the throne would in fact be the straw to break the weary camel's back. The new and last king's efforts at reform were no more successful than any of his predecessors. Despite some success at home, his handlers abroad were a constant impediment, plummeting the Commonwealth into again more violence hosting the armies of its European neighbors. This led to the first partition, the official start of the end. In 1772, the first partition saw Poland lose a significant chunk of both its population and the lands that housed them to the benefit of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. A brief period of attempted recovery within what remained of the Commonwealth, even including the writing of a constitution, was then followed by the second and third partitions. The fight was, at face value, abandoned. The Commonwealth was handed over to Russia and Prussia, and even a late but valiant last-ditch effort by General Tadeusz Kosciuszko, a hero of the American Revolution, could not change fate. The 18th century could not end before the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was wiped clean off the map of the contemporary world. Neither Poland nor Lithuania would exist officially again until after the Great War, over 100 years later. A big thank you again to MyHeritage for sponsoring our video. Learn more about your family history and enjoy the amazing features MyHeritage is offering by clicking on my link in the description.